Thanks for starting the recording. Thanks to everyone for being here and for being flexible to uh, hop over to a different system and take it away, Heather. OK, so we'll go ahead and get started. I did prepare some interactivity. Teams will work good in some aspects of it. Some I'm a little bit when I'm presenting in presenter mode because I don't have dual monitors. I can't see the chat and what's going on. So um, just to forewarn you, but we'll be using the chat feature um, as well. Uh, as and you guys can feel free to interrupt me if there's certain questions. I'm OK with that. Um, I don't want it to be just a. You know me lecturing you all. This is just a standard slide, so I'm going to skip over that, but that's for your reference. There's a lot of different acronyms that will be presented. Um, this presentation, Lauren, I will share with you afterwards because there's a lot of links and resources that everybody can have access to. Um, Perfect. And we'll I'll get that to you guys afterwards. But I'm going to do something different in this presentation. I'm going to start with a story. Um, and anyone who knows me personally knows that I am very passionate about sustainability. And often I want you guys to think about and reflect if you're going down the grocery line and you are given the option of paper versus plastic, which do you choose? You know, for me who, well, look at it from a probably a mix of an engineering and sustainability perspective. I will definitely use the plastic for the cold goods because if it gets paper gets wet, it may break. But in general, my preference is usually paper, right? Paper seems biodegradable. It's natural. It comes from trees. Um, so environmentally friendly paper seems like the obvious choice, especially when I think about plastic and I see plastic outside. It kind of blows and you see it on the ground and it doesn't degrade, right? So um, paper would be my natural choice. But what we often forget is what other impacts paper um, actually has on the environment. And if you look at the raw material manufacturing of paper, as shown in this image here, you can see that paper also has environmental footprint um, as well. And in today's presentation, I want you to think about these case studies or this this example here. It's just one. There's certainly others. Um, decisions that we make and see how they translate to the transportation sector. What are some decisions that we think are autom you know, think are more environmentally friendly? Um, and so we're going to go through some of those from and why, you know, what are the trends we're seeing from a na nationwide in how those environmentally friendly decisions are coming up more in the forefront. And then we're going to look at the methodologies. Uh, to see and now my view really changed, but this is kind of cool in the sense. Sorry, guys. Um, I can't see my slides now, but I'll keep this to the side. Um, no, this is not working. I don't know why this popped up. OK, perfect. So then then we're going to go through some of the methodologies to how would we actually assess or quantify? Was it paper or plastic that's more environmentally friendly? Um, and then we'll lastly sum up with what are some tools and resources? Um, moving forward. So the transportation sector, I would say is going through a very drastic change um, since January, since the new administration came in. And largely it's focused on this challenge. I'm sure you guys have heard about it. The net zero 2050 um, commitment. And that means that there's a large focus on reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. And if you look at this chart here that's shown on the screen, um, transportation is now the largest of the, the sectors that releases greenhouse gas emissions. And 29% is the number from 2019 uh, EPA uh, of how much is transportation related greenhouse gas emissions. So in order to reach this net zero um, goal of greenhouse gas emissions and net zero means that everything that's emitted, um, there's some savings that's either captured and there's some negative or savings that balances it out to be all zero. So we're not 
you know, emitting any greenhouse gases. We're having some sort of capturing um, effects that come into play for the greenhouse gases that are emitted and so that it's a, in a zero threshold. But the problem is when we look at that 29%, um, what does that actually include? So here I have the pavement life cycle stages shown um, in this image. There's material production, which has greenhouse gases. There's the construction that has greenhouse gases associated. There's the use phase. Certainly all the vehicles going over it has greenhouse gas um, emissions, the maintenance and preservation. And this was an area of interactivity if you want. Unfortunately, I won't be able to see the chat, but you could put in the chat, which phase do you think this 29% includes? Um, if you don't feel comfortable putting in the chat, that's fine. You could think about it, reflect. Um, I'll give you a moment for people to think of what does that 29% include? And for those of you that answered just the use phase of the from the vehicle emissions or vehicle yeah, the vehicle exhaust and emissions of using the transportation system, that is correct. Um, so that 29% is actually quite a bit more of greenhouse gases that is associated with transportation, um, the transportation sector, because it's not including the materials production emissions. It's not including the greenhouse gases from those initial construction activities. It's not including any of your greenhouse gases from the maintenance and preservation activities or the end of life. That 29% only includes the greenhouse gases from the use of the, the vehicles or the um, trucks uh, using our roadway system. Uh, in Keep in mind, it is transportation sector and all, so it is larger than just our vehicle emissions. It's also rail, barges, and air. But just in general, um, from what a DOT can influence, it is there more than the 29%. And to illustrate that, what we have shown here is those life cycle stages of pavement up in the left corner. And we have mapped them to the greenhouse gas sector emissions to give you an idea that where these emissions are actually being accounted into. So you have some emissions in raw material manufacturing that is being accounted in this 23% of the industry sector. Um, that would be, for example, the raw material manufacturing emissions of cement production, of the uh, concrete mix production, et cetera. Of course, with any type of activity, there's some transportation of the materials and goods. So in that raw material manufacturing phase, there would be greenhouse gas emissions that are from that transportation sector, but that's the transport of the goods, um, as well as electricity. And you see that, you know, all of these phases have a little bit of a mix of all of them. And the use phase is primarily just the transportation sector and some electricity. Um, again, as, are you guys seeing my presentation? I do not know what's going on because something keeps popping up. It's not done this ever to me before. I think it's yes. yes. good. Okay, good. I will just minimize that. Um, what is important to note is that these greenhouse gas em or these greenhouse gas emissions from the raw material manufacturing, mixed design, construction, maintenance, and rehab and end of life are what called the embodied carbon. So the embodied carbon um, is basically the life cycle emissions excluding that use phase. And there's a growing recognition that the embodied carbon and reducing those greenhouse gas emissions associated with the embodied carbon is important. As a result, there's a lot of different, um, you know, technologies or strategies that are being pushed and encouraged. For example, uh, using incorporating waste materials, you know, could that potentially reduce our embodied carbon? Um, you recycling increase our durability, use of local materials. These are all various strategies that we could use to reduce our embodied carbon. And many of the states have committed to re to that net zero 2050 goal. Um, the an earlier goal is actually the 2030 goal, which is about 50% reductions of greenhouse gas. And I did do a survey of all of the members of the NRRA and found that every single state has some sort of greenhouse gas reduction goals in place. 
Um, you know, some of the states, it's more just focused on the electricity production side of things, and some are more um, advanced or more aggressive, and they have statewide strategies um, to move forward and looking at all of the, the sectors. The challenges, and just similar to our earlier example in the beginning with the plastic versus paper, a lot of times we stick to one solution because of a, we think of it as a feel good. We do, we recycle because we think it's environmentally friendly, just like as I was in that store and I chose paper because I thought that that's more environmentally friendly. And that we're getting to a point where we really can't improve what we don't measure. You know, what is the true environmental footprint of a pavement? We don't have a good number for the various pavement types because we have not been measuring that. Um, if you were to think of what's the different costs, life cycle costs of the pavements, I know many of you could could tell tell me what for the various different pavement types, what that life cycle cost would be. We don't have the same quite understanding of what would be the embodied carbon of our pavements. But with that, that transitions to us who, how do we measure that? How do we assess the environmental footprint of our pavements so that we can choose whether paper versus plastic is environmentally fr more friendly or, you know, whether it's, do we need to, do we need to design for longer life pavements or should we use recycled material? These are some of those strategies we could be looking at. And the approach is what's called life cycle assessment. Um, life cycle assessment is not a new approach. This was created back in 1970s. And there's actually some papers saying that it's even more standardized than life cycle cost analysis, which is something that everyone I'm sure is familiar with because um, it's done quite commonly in payment design um, decision making. But with life cycle assessment, it looks at all the material inputs from that raw material acquisition and as well as the energy, and then also looks at all the outputs, which would be your wastes. And it could waste could be a solid or it could be waste to um, water and air as in emissions. And it looks at all of those wastes and it tabulates all of them and translates them to environmental potential environmental impacts, one being the potential for global warming, which is what a lot of states are focusing on as they want to get down to that net zero um, goals. For those of you that are unfamiliar with life cycle assessment, FHWA does have a resource here. So this link here at the bottom is a primer on LCA for pavements. It was completed by the Sustainable Pavements Program back about five years ago now, and it just kind of outlines how you would do a life cycle assessment for pavements in particular. One thing I do want you all to know is that LCA is not the same as LCCA. And I always put this slide on here um, because there is a lot of confusion with the two. It is very simple to leave off a C or add a C. I know I am guilty of doing that, being that I work in both and talk about them so frequently. Um, sometimes just mistakenly, I, I say life cycle cost analysis when I really meant life cycle assessment. That's one area. But the other area is, is a lot of people don't know the difference. And so it's very important when you're having conversations, especially with higher ups that are looking at trying to implement these two tools to be sure that they are understanding the same technique that you're understanding, that you're speaking about the same um, methodology. Life cycle cost analysis is life cycle is the economic piece and evaluates the life cycle um, life cycle cost of a product or decision. And then life cycle assessment is very similar, but it only focuses on that environmental piece. And these two assessment techniques are very important to reaching our overall sustainability goals. If we're looking at balancing that triple bottom line, which is the social impacts, economic impacts, and environmental impacts. And what's so powerful about those three tools, or sorry, the two, life cycle cost analysis and life cycle assessment, is they can quantify the potential environmental impacts, but with that life cycle perspective thinking, which is important for um, concepts of sustainability, because it's not just about balancing the social, economic, and environmental impacts for today, but it's also 
with that life cycle perspective because we don't want to compromise the future's ability to meet their needs in these three areas as well. Um, with social, there's there are similar assessments, life cycle assessments that are socially um, with social indicators, but they're not as well advanced. So from a transportation perspective, you know, the social indicators really come through in what green rating systems such as FHWA's invest or there's green roads um, as well as envision that are green rating systems for transportation infrastructure type projects. With regards to life cycle assessment, back about in 2019, FHWA conducted a study with bringing together the planners along with the payment designers and engineers. And what we wanted to figure out is how does LCA fit into the planning and project delivery? And where are our best avenues to start integrating this into the design decision making process? And where are the most barriers if we were to do so? And the goal is, again, you know, LCA is a great tool to assess the environmental performance. And if you're specifically looking for, you know, lower embodied carbon, trying to get to that net zero goals, it's a great tool for doing such. And if we want to do that, how can we integrate it into our transportation decision making, but also make it so that it can follow up and inform some of the higher level goals and plans from the transportation agency? And so that was the effort of this, this study. And what was the main outcome is what's shown in green here were the avenues um, where we should start begin focusing uh, incorporating LCA because they had the least amount of barriers. They're they're pretty ready and that's what the stakeholders felt. So in the construction phase, you know, that is a great way we could be quantifying and benchmarking that our understanding of how much greenhouse gas is associated with our pavements um, or the as belts. Um, you could do that through requesting what's called environmental product de decoration. And we can use this information then to really answer that first question that I posed in the beginning. You know, what is the embodied carbon of our pavements? We don't really know. The first way to start is to start collecting that information. And we can do that through environmental product integrations. When we collect enough of it, maybe we could start informing our project development. And that would be this other box here, which shows LCA support and payment design. So we could take that information and then maybe inform our design and decision making process. And the reason why we felt this one was um, would be fairly, you know, had least barriers to implement is it really follows the procedures that um, states do already with life cycle cost analysis. So it fits parallel with the life cycle cost analysis and you could use your life cycle cost analysis um, with a little bit of additional information um, from the environmental side and have the environmental impact as well to determine which route you wanted to go. So if you were to do an LCA, there are there is a lot of data that you need to collect in this process to get started. Um, there, this data it consists of industry data as well as data from the agencies and contractors. If you think about life cycle cost analysis, you know, if you have a raw material acquisition, they may do some um, manufacturing processes and then they sell it to the next stage, which is maybe the asphalt mix um, producers. Well, when the asphalt mix producers mix it in with the aggregate, mix the binder in with the aggregate, you know, there's a cost increase. We have a good way to translate the costs as it goes through the supply chain and communicate that information. When it comes to this, the actual environmental impacts, that's where it gets a little tricky. We don't have clear methods and techniques like we do the dollar um, to translate the actual environmental impacts. Um, one of the ways, as I mentioned earlier, is through EPDs. But if you are curious of getting started with LCA, FHWA did release a tech brief on the different data needs. And um, the link is on this slide. So I recommend that you check out that link as well to get an idea of what additional data do we need from industry to supplement these various assessments and uses of LCA. But from the agency side, 
you know, they, you would be in charge of, or you would know best what type of treatments, what were the intervals of those treatments, what are the quantities. And, and so it really does take data from agencies and contractors, as well as um, upstream data from the industry supply chain. So to zoom in on that concept, what I've shown here is taking the life cycle phases that was on that on the previous slide and I'm actually mapping out the unit processes and the unit processes shows, you know, for each production, so aggregate production here at the top, you have raw materials coming in. So that's the input. You have energy coming in and then you'll have some waste and emissions coming out and your product is the aggregate. Similarly for binder. You can have raw materials, energy, there's waste and emissions, and you have binder. All of these components with the aggregate asphalt and add mixtures come in to asphalt mixing, and that's a different industry. Um, this is just a LCA of the manufacturing of a pavement for asphalt. You could have a similar one for concrete um, in some of the, it would be, it would look very similar. Just change the asphalt to concrete and asphalt binder to cement, for example, but it does illustrate how they all have energy. They all have some transportation that there. It's almost what we call the building blocks for LCA. And so each one of these boxes, the aggregate production, what industry is starting to develop are called EPDs to communicate that information. Um, so there could be an aggregate EPD which the asphalt mix producer would would ask for and include in the asphalt mix EPD, which if you're from an agency, you could request an EPD for the asphalt mixture and theoretically it would include the aggregate EPD, asphalt binder EPD, asphalt mixture EPDs and the primary data from that asphalt mix plant all together for you to understand what is that environmental footprint um, of the mixture. Likewise, then you would also have to, to get the full life cycle. You would have to look at the pavement construction, the maintenance activities and end of life, um, just as this um, ma material manufacturer part is broken up into the various material manufacturing components. You would have those similar components in this maintenance field if you are using any addition you know, for a mill of fill or for example, or if you're doing a um, overlay or um, chip seal or whatever, you would have the same type of material manufacturing um, activities. It's just not broken out here. To help us collect this information, the construction has is a great point of collecting EPDs and beginning to, for us to start building out these components and understanding what is the greenhouse gases associated. So um, at this point, I was going to ask everybody to raise their hand to see how many knew what EPDs are. Um, I've mentioned it quite a bit, but we're going to dive in for those of you that don't. Um, EPDs are essentially a life cycle assessment. The difference with EPDs is they follow what's called the product category rules. Um, and so EPD is, it stands for environmental product decoration. It's like a nutrition label that communicates your global warming potential, the ozone depletion, smog potential. They are standard, following a set of rules for one given product. So for example, in that schematic, we were looking at the asphalt mixtures. So they would define how asphalt mixtures is going to communicate their environmental footprint to an agency um, that could be purchasing that. What is nice about EPDs is they are created with stakeholders in mind so, um, and stakeholders in, a, in the process as well. So they a good, um, a good PCR, which is the rules that are, are written, would include you know, stakeholders from the industry would include LCA consultants, would also include non-government agencies or customers, all in part of the process. Um, they're very transparent and ideally they should be created in a way that could make it comparable. Um, that's essential 
of the PCR is, is to make it so that everybody's following the same rules when they create their LCA such that the results of this label can be comparable from one mixed design to another, for example. There are various types of EBDs. When we're looking at bidding, it's the most specific. It is what's called a plant specific, a mix specific or a product specific facility specific EPD. So that means that that EPD that you if you get it from a for from a certain asphalt mix producer X, it is their primary data it is their mix designs. It is their emissions. It's their transportation distances. What they don't control would be estimated. So or preferably using another EPD. And that's and that's what a plant specific um, product specific facility specific EPD is. And so that is what is used in that bidding stage. If you want to use an um, EPD as it's a building block, it wouldn't be to a broader LCA. That's when we would use more of an industry wide um, or a regional EPD. And so that's where you look at the averages, because at that point, if you're looking at your design, you may not know exactly what mixed design you want to go to or exactly what facility, for example, would be producing that mixed design. So it's more appropriate to use an average. Um, in general, if you were to search and research the EPDs that are available, the majority of them are going to be these um, product facility specific EPDs. Um, along with there are several industry wide EPDs being published. And the reason why the industry wide EPDs are being published is the EPDs really came about when green rating systems got rid of the credits for recycling content. All back to everyone starting to realize that recycling could be a feel good, you know, we, we haven't really measured that. And so now we're moving to this stage of measurement. And so the green rating systems, with that in mind, got rid of those credits for our just recycling and introduced requirements for having EPDs. So products have to submit um, in order to get the credit, submit an EPD, but they also want to encourage that the EPD has lower environmental impo impacts than the industry wide average. So that's why you'll see industries also publishing industry wide um, EPDs. It is important to know these differences because there is a movement for requiring EPDs um, from statewide uh, purchasing or green public procurement. And they'll often reference these terms of product facility specific EPD or they may reference an industry wide EPD um, in general. So what makes the EPD actually comparable really depends on the product category rules. The product category rules are these industry consensus consensus standards, and they are what is used to develop the EPD so that it's consistent and transparent because anybody can then, you know, access the, and read the rules and understand what assumptions were made uh, to, to create that EPD. We do have a tech brief available on you know, the overview of EPDs that I would encourage you guys to, to check out, as well as the process of creating EPDs and PCRs. And then we have an additional webinar that just spends 30 minutes on EPDs and PCRs in general. I will like to note at this point in time, there is no federal law or requirement for PCRs or EPDs in green public procurement. However, I do know that, and this is publicly available, there is a proposed bill um, being written looking at uh, uh, encouraging EPDs for procurement. Um, it has not passed yet. It's just in the proposed stage from a federal standpoint. From construction materials, there's many different um, EPD programs already available. So industry has been working on this for the last 10 years, actually. I think most uh, product category rules are are, um, are valid for five years. They, you know, they recognize that industry changes and there's new technological advancements, um, maybe even better data sources that should be used to help them assess the environmental footprint. So they are encouraged to be updated periodically. And Concrete is already on, for example, the second version of their PCRs, product category rules. 
Um, currently, for example, hot mix asphalt is undergoing a PCR creation. If there is a material that's not on this list, that doesn't mean that it's, they may not have a PCR. You should always go out and check to see if the PCR is created. However, I know, for example, um, asphalt binders does not have a, a PCR created. So you, you really couldn't get EPDs for asphalt binders right now because there is no PCR created. Anyone could create that PCR. You see ASTM has gotten into the business of creating some of the PCRs as well as some of the industry um, associations such as uh, you have the Portland Cement Association, the National Asphalt Pavement Association also being active in creating the PCRs. In the initial creation, it does take, it can take up to two years to do it. Um, and that's because in order to create the PCRs, not only do you have that committee of all the different stakeholders, you would also want to do an LCA in tangent of creating the PCR so that you're informing, you know, what decisions make sense. Is the data available or, or whatnot? As you set forth to write how the industry would be conducting their environmental footprint. If a PCR is already created, it can be much shorter of a process around a year. The PCRs will be reviewed by a third party after the um, PCR is created and also goes out to a public consultation process. So it is quite transparent and everybody, you know, competitors can comment on each other's uh, PCRs. And there is that again, third party review of what decisions were made during the process and it's usually a committee in the third party review can including an lca consultant and again specific subject matter experts the challenge is is that it's quite hard to write pcrs product category rules that actually enable comparability and there's nobody overseeing all the pcrs to ensure that there's harmonization um, comparability means that you know, within a product category, so they're written for a specific product such as concrete, all the EPDs of concrete theoretically should be comparable. The first phase of concrete EPD or EPDs that were created, the PCR did not specify the background data sets. And a background data set, if you remember that image of the unit processes where I said energy and transportation, all of these processes use some sort of energy and transportation. The environmental impacts of these activities should be the same, and they didn't specify what data sources should be used for those processes. And as a result, the EPDs in the first phase of the concrete program were not really comparable because it could have been just because they chose different data sets to use. And so that's why we have what we've created here, three phases. So some of the earlier EPDs that were being created were just really communication tools to demonstrate that their you know, industries come be coming forth, trying to transparently communicate their environmental footprint and quantify their environmental footprint. As the PCRs have gotten better over time and these you know, issues have been identified, they're, they're becoming more comparable. So I would say the EPDs of the concrete current PCR, you know, they are prescribing their background data sets. And so now they can be used in as a procurement aid and they can help you determine, you know, what concrete mixture has lower embodied carbon if you wanted to use that in your decision making process. But as, as you recall that graph, you know, we have other uses of EPDs. We could use them as a building block to that broader LCA to inform our pavement design. But to get there, we need what's called harmonization. Harmonization is across the product lines. So not just within concrete, we need concrete and asphalt to use the same data sets for electricity, the same data sets for transportation, which are those background data sets. Of course, they would put in how much energy they use. What I'm talking about is the data, the environmental impacts associated with that raw material manufacturing of the petroleum, for example, that would be used in transportation or the coal if they're using a, a coal for electricity, et cetera. Those need to be um, background data or those are the background data and they need to be um, prescribed and the same. So that's what harmonization is. That would be the ultimate third step and ideal step in use of EPDs. 
to be able to use it in pavement design and to ensure that there's environmental improvements. We need to have both comparability and harmonization. There are many agencies that are interested in using EPDs. Um, at first, it was the material manufacturers that were creating EPDs for marketing. One of the things that I would always ask is if you ever hear that I'm a net negative um, material or a net zero material, you should be asking, where is your LCA? Do you have an EPD? Because that's the quantification piece. Saying you're net zero carbon or you don't have any body carbon, you don't know. It depends on where they started measuring it. The actual quantification piece comes in with that LCA or the EPD. Um, so that is a way for, for uh, manufacturers to communicate their environmental performance. The state and local interest of using EPDs is, is largely starting from uh, a public or purchasing requirements. And the first state to pass a bill was California and the, in their Buy Clean California Act. And what that requires for five different materials that were select or select materials, they require EPDs. They've collected a bunch of EPDs, then they average those EPDs to come up with thresholds. And now the material manufacturers must be below or than some given threshold in order to bid on certain projects. So that is how California has moved forth. There are a lot of other states listed here that also had proposed legis legislation that was very similar to California with um, minor tweaks. Um, City of Portland, I know passed in Oregon. Oregon as a state is still on the process of looking at um, implementing a Buy Clean Act and has different activities. Washington State as well. I know Minnesota had some activities. And what is not on this list is Colorado's another new state that's coming forth with activities. Um, and then the New York, New Jersey Port Authority is also um, requiring EPDs um, in the future, looking at requiring EPDs in the future. They have written a spec um, asking for EPDs. So there is a movement that this is going to be you know, this is the direction that both industry and a lot of states are moving forward. And as I mentioned earlier, there is no federal requirements right now, but there is even talk at from the federal level that EPDs may be incorporated into green public procurement systems. In addition, what I mentioned earlier is that green rating systems are really what sparked the creation of EPDs when they got rid of the recycling credits and instead required environmental product declarations. Again, yes. Um, I just wanted to let you know that it's 56 after. Uh, Perfect. Just give you a little time heads up. Thanks. Sounds good. Um, and I know we got started a little late, but in in general, so those, I guess it's being recorded. So those that have to leave can leave, but I'll just continue a little bit over the time um, to carry out the rest of the presentation because I think we got started around 20 minutes late. But yeah, sounds good. In, in general, um, there's currently no overarching agency. The EPDs and PCRs are governed by ISO standards, but ISO does not certainly oversee and require that the piece program operators collaborate and make sure that harmonization is actually happening. As a result, FHWA is trying to encourage and document what would be the best practices for creating PCRs as well as EPDs. Um, and the goal would be is for agencies, you know, if you're interested in encouraging EPDs or you foresee that something could be coming down your path, that you could, you know, take some of this guidance and participate in stakeholder um, groups that are creating PCRs. Um, that's certainly a great way to, to learn the process and get more involved and help us towards that comparability and harmonization. Um, you could also, though, look at encouraging just the creation of EPDs by asking for EPDs, helping educate the local um, manufacturing community about EPDs, um, and, and look at even conducting a pilot program. So this, there's a list of things that you could do, you know, even despite all of, you know, the technical barriers in making sure that they're comparable and harmonized for the broader LCA use, I still think we can be encouraging the use of EPDs and the creation of EPDs as we move forward to that ultimate end goal. Um, with internally with FHWA, one of the opportunities to get involved would be through our demo project. 
um, the link here that says pilot case or pilots is to the pooled fund request. To, so if you wanted to do some sort of project that is in line with whether it's requesting EPDs or seeing how EPDs could fit into an LCA, workshop on EPDs, um, that could fit into that pooled study, pooled fund um, study request. And the pooled fund, it, it kind of sounds like it's too good to be true because you give $10,000 and you can get $250,000 to help you with whatever project as long as it fits that need of sustainability and benchmarking your environmental footprint. Um, with that, we do have a few states that have already committed. Um, Arizona is one of them, uh, focusing more on resiliency side, but Colorado is going to be looking at how to incorporate EPDs into their specs and starting to get ready and ahead of the current legislation that may be coming forth in their state. So just to give you an idea of some of the members. We also created an LCA benchmarking tool, and this is all through the efforts of the Sustainable Payment Program. And what is unique about the LCA tool is that it is one, one of the first LCA tools for payments that was created with various stakeholders input. Um, state DOTs were part of a panel, so it's really created for what decisions you would make for uh, from a mixture design perspective. Um, or pavement structural design or maintenance and, and rehab type of strategies. It uses public background data sets. I think it's very important if we're going to be using this um, for decision making that we don't use third party data sets that are purchased and we use what's in the public domain that's freely available and that's all in line with being transparent. And then it looks at incorporating EPDs into that as a building block to build up our LCAs. It is an Excel based tool and for that matter, I would say it's educate, you know, more of an education based tool. I think we're going to need tools in the future that are more web based and can be um, easily updated. But I do think it's a great tool to test out how an LCA could work at your agency if you're interested. So moving towards the last phase of the, the presentation are the tools and resources. So how can you get you know, started with LCA? What is and, and involved in creating some of the tools that I have discussed earlier. And that is really through, you know, FHWA is trying to take a leadership role in this. We've reorganized the pavement materials program areas um, as shown in this figure here. And in the center is sustainability. Um, and that is the ultimate end goal is how can we make our pavements more sustainable in the fact that they're more economically efficient, um, environmental and have social uh, benefits as well, looking to that balance, the triple bottom line. And within that, and critical to the sustainability program area, FHB has the Sustainable Pavements Program, which vision and mission is to advance the knowledge and practice of designing, constructing, and maintaining more sustainable pavements. So the whole presentation, you know, we talked about life cycle perspective. We're trying to incorporate that life cycle perspective and life cycle thinking, even in the mission, vision and mission of the program for sustainability. We work very closely with stakeholder engagement. So um, critical to the program is a technical working group. Um, so you're more than welcome to be involved in that. We put out various education um, resources as well as develop guidance and tools. So for the stakeholder engagement, again, following the theme of life cycle perspective, we want individuals that have various subject matter expertise in all the life cycle phases and from various domains, not, you know, not just um, agencies, but academia as well as industry. We meet twice a year. Um, in the past, we would be uh, in person and lately it's been virtual and moving forward, we're going to do a mixture of the two. Um, so we'll always have some virtual component because more um, more were attending those meetings when they were virtual as well as in person to really get into the details and weeds and discuss some of the concepts which i think is in person's a little bit easier to do the first phase of the program was really focused on quantifying or documenting the state of practice and there was a reference manual that was created as well as really diving into the um, how do you quantify 
the environmental performance. The reason we didn't focus on the economic performance is that's already been, you know, life cycle cost is already fairly standard at most states, but the environmental performance, we saw there was a real need and gap that we could contribute there. So at the bottom of this pyramid is the, the one of the main deliverables is that primer that I mentioned earlier on. Um, and that was about developed about five years ago. But the end goal in this whole vision that I showed or tried to illustrate earlier is to move it towards specifications and policies. How can we use LCA for specifications and policies? And so the, the last five years, we've been really focusing on how do we get up this pyramid so that we can use LCA um, to inform our decisions. And a lot of it relies on getting data. How do we communicate that data? How do we store that data and getting creation of tools? And so that's been our large part of our effort in the last uh, five. With that, I mentioned we created the LCA benchmarking tool, LCA PAVE. Um, this tool not only quantifies environmental impacts of uh, materials and pavements, but also various treatments. You can make comparisons of the material sources, hauling distance, maintenance, preservation activities, but it uses the public data. Um, so in, in parallel to creating this tool, we worked with the federal LCA Commons. It's a group of other federal agency representatives that are working in the domain of life cycle assessment to identify where you know public data exists, what are some of the gaps to create and, and support our tool. Moving forward, we would like to demo that tool with anyone who is interested. And so the next phase of our program will really be focused on how can we, um, you know, actually trying out and piloting LCA in, in decision making with state DOTs. And so in conclusion, um, you know, in, if we want to determine, you know, what is the environment, you know, more sustainable option or what is the more environmentally friendly option, we need to think of it from a life cycle perspective. We need to consider all the life cycle phases, not initial. Um, and for the environmental perspective, LCA is the tool. That's the methodology that should be used. Um, and with that, if you know one of the the key areas that we're trying to to grow is we want to be a resource for states that are interested in in this area of sustainability. And we're working on tools, we're working on guidance, best practices. We want to be a partner with states to better understand how LCA can be incorporated into their decision making process. Um, and with that, I think there's my contact information and we can open it up for question and answer if we want to take some time. And I'm going to stop sharing so I can. Thank you so much, Heather. Heather. See. If you have questions, yeah, it looks like Bernard, Bernard, Bernard does. You can unmute yourself. That's the lovely thing of Teams. Yeah, I have a question. Sure. So, uh, first, first and foremost, let me say uh, with the presentation you just made, we are very proud that you are from Minnesota. <laughs> So having, having said that, this is a good time for us to hear uh, these uh, sustainability uh, nuggets because we are diving into a phase where we are, most of our main road phase two initiatives are uh, so sustainability and resiliency driven. Mm -hmm. And we've been asking ourselves, how do we really quantify how do we really get to the um, uh, determination of a particular mixed design or a particular technology being sustainable and resilient? But this has shed some light. But the specific question I wanted to ask, like let's take, an, um, for instance, the reduction in um, uh, cementitious content. Mm -hmm. 
carbon cure, you know, carbon use of carbon uh, for sustainable concrete pavements. In a in a nutshell, if you if we wanted to run with what you have given us so far, we uh, we've heard of EPD, LCA, Invest, and PCR. Um, we don't know these things as much as you and uh, Dr. Uh, Rangelov. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, what what are the what what should we at this stage? Because we are trying to develop RFPs, and we want to target these things right for the on onset. What would you advise as a nugget? You know, so we don't leave it out, and at the end, you know, uh, we lose that step in the process of trying to ensure that these initiatives are sustainable. What is the basic nugget you would have us do? Should we require the uh, PCRs? Should we do the LCA or should we just do invest, use invest as a basic way of uh, doing our evaluation? It depends on what your goals are, Bernard. Invest is a great tool from a transportation big picture project. And it, within invest, there are credits for doing what I spoke about, which was quantifying the environmental impact using LCA. So invest is more flexible. It's a little bit more round, well rounded in the fact that it looks at the social, some of the social indicators. It looks at some of the economic and environmental um, and tries to push different best practices. If you want to look at what I see most states trying to figure out and grapple with is how do we identify strategies to reduce our greenhouse gases that are pertinent to the decisions we make? You know, and and I say that because that 29% that was given earlier on, that's the transportation sector, that's what's thrown around, that's the operational phase. And, you know, as a transportation agency, you can only influence so much of that mobility. You're not going to influence the, you know, vehicle emission standards, maybe some, not so much. But you can influence that embodied carbon. And that's why I focused on all of the, the other decisions that we make as an agency in our um, design and purchasing and maintenance activities. So I would focus then on let's look at requesting EPDs and learning about them so that we can increase the awareness amongst our suppliers um, about EPDs and LCA as well as asking for LCAs um, or looking at using them in a broader LCA per se. Um, I do think it's not one, it's two, because asking for EPDs is, is, is more on the supplier end, but from an agency then looking at how LCA can fit in your agency is more um, what, what you could do internally, because we're going to have to work together with industry on this yeah. and, and moving forward. And many, you know, you mentioned carbon care. One of the things with carbon care before before we even research is does plastic make sense for in in asphalt or does carbon cure make sense maybe we should be asking them have you done an lca how did you quantify because carbon cure um i think they often advertise that they're a net an either a net negative carbon or neutral you know net zero carbon um choice option well, how did they quantify that? Where's the LCA? Where's the data that shows that? And um, I, those are the important questions that I think we should be asking the material manufacturers that are giving us this these marketing tidbits. We should be asking for the LCA um, and learning about them as well as decision makers. Thank you. And there's another hand up here. Um, uh, hi, Heather. This is Barry Salman here uh, from Syracuse University. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, I do have some uh, uh, questions about the difficulties uh, with, uh, you know, generating an LCA. Uh, so, uh, of course, when we talk about especially process of product based LCAs, it's very difficult to draw a boundary, I guess, around upstream activities. We can very quickly go all the way to Big Bang, right? So like especially when you have uh, products used in 
cycles. Like, uh, do you include the con uh, construction equipment in your LCA? You know, the materials used in the equipment or materials used in producing the equipment in the first place. You know, you can just take it up uh, quite mm -hmm. uh, exponentially. So that's difficult. And also, when we work in a construction in, in, in the construction sector, unlike manufacturing industry, things are really out of control in many cases, right? Uh, so. Um, that also creates some challenge, I think, when we compare to product, more product based, like manufacturing sector applications. So how do you think we should approach from a research standpoint or pra pra practice, practical standpoint? How should we approach these complications and how can we be more involved? How can we help in these regards? Thank you. I think that's a great question. Um, what I would love to see happening in the research side of LCIAs is the use of the product category rules that industries are setting forth. And they, so industry has come together on how they're going to quantify, for example, the greenhouse or the environmental footprint of concrete mixtures. Yes, it is written from the concrete mix you know, manufacturer's perspective. So the primary data there that would be given is the energy used, et cetera. However, some of those questions that you brought up, Salman, was what should be included? Should the construction equipment of that plant be included or not? Or, you know, how, you know, those boundaries, those have all been defined. And they've been defined through a rigorous process and a third party review process and LCA informing how much do these processes actually impact the end outcome. And so I think instead of everybody kind of redefining those rules and setting those boundaries, we should be starting to work together in those practices and using them. So from an industry perspective, I think, um, or an industry research perspective, you could still use those PCRs, yes, with some nuances and differences, um, because you may not be providing primary data for the um, energy used to mix the concrete but you could be providing other in insights. Um, so that's what I would like to see is, you know, is everybody coming around the standards that are being created for the various materials. Um, in addition, you know, I, I think this is more towards the end of um, the tools that I showed were, but they're very static right now. Um, I know that I think California had to go through digitally entering in, you know, they're not digital EP EPDs right now. We don't have the data, the communication connections um, that flows the information into the various databases that could facilitate uh, the creation of LCAs. So that's more from, I think, more of the software engineering type of database metadata management perspective that I think research could help grow in advance is taking these static tools that are right now, I, you know, FHBA created in Excel and using more of an open um, source interface. And, and we've started some effort with that, with OpenLCA and growing that platform and creating an API, but I think that's the future. And how does they integrate then with your building information models? The architectural community, I think, is a little bit further than us um, in this, in the horizontal. Um, community with this integration and communication of the data. Barry, I see that you have your hand up. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, I'm fighting with my mute button here. Good to see you again, and I appreciate your passion for the topic. Um, as we try to move forward, um, what do you see the role of FHWA being in this process? And the reason I ask is because, you know, we can go down the road of having a bunch of states coming up with different ways of doing business. And before we know it, we've got 50 different policies across the country, which is not good for anybody. Do you see FHWA as more of providing maybe some guidance and tools and frameworks for different levels? Or where do you see your role going and how do you see the legislative processing impacting it? That's. A great question and the fact that I, I totally agree with you, Barry. I foresee us going down the path of craziness and not only craziness from 50 different states, we have Canada that's in looking at a buy clean now. And many of the manufacturers operate in Canada and the US. So this also impacts international trade. As a result, I think 
that because it in, it's not just state boundaries, but international boundaries, I think federal the federal government should have a strong role. Um, and that is a message that I'm communicating upwards, whether or not they bite on that and we have the legal authority is another question. Um, so I think that's what makes it challenging with that. The other thing that I've been trying to work on is group gather a group of states that are aware of this coming and create awareness within AASHTO and TRB, because I think recently, at least within TRB, um, in the research community, there was a sustainable pavements committee that's kind of now a subcommittee, no longer at a committee level, and so it's kind of hidden. Um, and within AASHTO, we really haven't found the the space of where this could rise up in, in AASHTO and, and see where their involvement could be. Um, so we're trying to work at various levels to facilitate that so that it doesn't end up with 50 different standards, if that makes sense, Barry. Yes, thank you. And I could ask a million questions, but I'll save some for a separate conversation in future. Yes, feel free to reach out to me um, with any questions. Feel free to, if you're interested in anything I said, or you could help me with the AASHTO side of things in creating that awareness and the need for a group for this, please let me know because um, I'm trying to increase our network um, to get the message heard. I think we're good. We're about an hour. So we probably can wrap up. What do you think, Lauren? Sounds good to me.